in Lancaster visiting with my friend Craig Hartraft. He has the number one team in Pennsylvania having sold 421 homes in 2023 with an average sales price of $382,000. His lead generation is massive, focusing on TV and radio ads, direct mail, and Zillow leads. Craig, it's good to see you again. Nice to see you again. It's been a while. It's been a while. How did we meet originally? Back in Star Power days. I don't know what year it was, um, but I was involved in Star Power since the mid 90s. So when did you get involved in Star Power? Oh, good Lord, don't ask me dates. I have no <laughs> idea. It was later than you, okay. but earlier than the others. That's so exactly. that's, that's, it was somewhere in between. Yeah. Those are fun days. I had some really fond memories. So Star Power, by the way, is was an amazing uh, group of high producing agents. They had yearly conferences. They had Star Power retreats for the stars. It's recently starred up again yep. with Amy Stair. She's doing a great job. So if you want to go to starpower.com and uh, check out the next conference, I think it's going to be in, I don't know. It was in Nashville, the last one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Craig, how'd you get in the business? Well, back in 1989, um, I was a police officer, full-time police officer down here in Lancaster City. And real estate kind of intrigued me, so I uh, wanted to take my real estate license and uh, try part-time. Um, but I couldn't afford taking my real estate license. I was making $14,500 a year as a police officer. But there was a project downtown, they were putting an extension on a bank and uh, they need off to police officers to direct traffic. Mm. And they were paying $10 an hour, and it was in the winter time, not many people did it, so I was able to do enough shifts to earn the money to become a, get my real estate license. We, we had dinner last night um, with his lovely wife, Mate, and my boyfriend and videographer, Rob. Yep. And we were discussing that you, um, like throughout, like, when you were in the army, you always had a second job the whole time. And one of the, and, you, and at the beginning of your career, you were working 20 hour days. One of the things I'm finding with all top agents is they're willing to put in the long hours to succeed. You have to have that foundation. And, and do you think that's just part of your personality or is that because you were goal driven? I was goal driven. I was gold driven, yeah. And now I'm reaping the benefits from that. So I don't have those long hours like I used to. And I try to share that with newer agents too. You have to put the time in the beginning yeah. and then you'll be able to re reap the rewards down the road. It was interesting. So after the first six months in the business, you sold one house. One house. And uh, you came home and mate said, I think you need to quit. And you were thinking she meant quit real estate. And she says, no stop let's let's stop being she talked to your boss and <laughs> she checked it out first and then figured out which which direction you needed to go in she's my rock were you surprised that she went in that direction yes because mm. i was doubting myself mm. um, but she, by her believing in me that reinstilled my confidence and then when i went full time fear is the biggest motivator I didn't want to fail, so just went right in. I think after my first full year, full time, I think I closed like 22, 24 homes that year. That's another trait I'm finding in the top agents that fear is, a, the, is probably the biggest motivator, yeah. which is fascinating because um, you don't want fear in your life, but it, then you can use fear to channel towards what you do want in your life. I agree with you 100%. That's awesome. Why Lancaster? Well, I grew up in Lancaster County. Uh, my wife is from Lancaster County, so all of our family's here. Uh, so I left in the military for four years, but when I came back, this is where we wanted to start a family. Well, uh, if you don't know, Lancaster is Amish country, and I haven't seen a single horse and buggy <laughs> since we've been here. All I've seen is backed up traffic uh, the whole time. Well, it's rush hour today. Oh, okay. They don't, they don't come out in their uh, horses. They could just go around the side, I suppose. All right. Tell me about your team. Team, I have 25, 26 team members. Uh, with my team, it's broken down where I have certain ages that only work with sellers, and then I have certain ages that only work with buyers. So I still have that model. And then I have a small support uh, staff, because they're great, they're very efficient. So I have a contract manager, I have a listing manager, I have a receptionist, 
and then a couple of uh, part-time assistants and a, a, a virtual um, assistant also. And how many sides are you doing a, a year? We'll probably do between 425 to 450 transactions this year. Oh, I just want to take a nap when I hear that. <laughs> That's a lot of deals, Craig. Yeah. Well, awesome. And average sales price is? We just looked at that. We're at $403,000. And average sales price in the Lancaster market? Around 350 to 375. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So when you want to bring on new people to your team, what are your practices? Well, we just changed that probably in the last three to five years that made a huge impact is when we're, and we're talking about more like buyer's agents that we're bringing on uh, to come on. We have so many leads, we, we don't have enough people to- Service them. Yes. We're going to talk about leads in a minute, but okay. how do you go about- how do So you... we know people struggle getting in the business because they need income. And you know, if you're in the 100% commission, there's no income set for three to six months. So we said, what can we do to help them out? So what we do is we bring on someone on board and one of our senior buyer specialists will mentor them from anywhere from four to six months. During that time frame, part of their um, training is their showing agents. So they're helping all of our agents. And do they get a showing agent fee for yes. that? Yes. That's a smart move. So we're compensating them during Who their pays training. Who for the showing agent? You or the agent that the, has the listing? The agent will pay part and we will pay part. Okay. So it's a benefit to our, our agents. And you're looking long term for the team. Yes. And that has really helped us find quality talent that we wouldn't have been able to find before. How are you finding talent? Well, we're, we're using Wise Hire. Uh, we're emailing the real estate community. It's word of mouth, um, a variety of different. Our last five hires were not realtors. Um, they were folks that just came out of other industries. And, uh, one gentleman was a landscaper and uh, came out and he's just killing it. We have another person who was a Verizon uh, salesperson and came into it and is killing it. Um, so another lady, Brooke just came on board a year, year and a half ago, and she was an admin in an insurance company. And this year she has 19 under contract, less than, less than a full year in the business. Oh, she's going to be a star. But that mentoring, her mentor is Sarah, it just really helped the whole situation. And do you do anything to, I mean, how do you determine whether to bring somebody on? Do you do any personality testing? Do you check up on references? What do you do? We, do, we have them fill out an application, uh, but before we meet with them, we have them take a test, a, a DISC personality test. But this DISC test is a little bit more in depth. We call it on steroids. We have a consultant now in North Carolina. His name is John Pike. Um, so we will send them a DISC program, uh, profile, send it to them. We won't meet with them until we see that profile. So we know how to handle the interview from there. And sometimes we won't even go for the interview depending on how that test comes back. So I would imagine if it's, it's interesting, you know, almost all really successful agents are D's or I's in DISC. And yet the top um, broker on Cape Cod is an SI, or is he, is Paul an SI or an SC? I can't remember. And he doesn't have the normal profile. So there are exceptions to the rule that if I had looked just at a disc profile for Paul, I would have made a mistake if I was looking to hire him. Yeah, we'll, if we're borderline, we'll still meet with someone. Okay. Because uh, we're taking it, we're having a mini interview over the phone. And we feel, okay, just in case it's incorrect, we're going to still meet with them. But if our initial phone interview is not going well and then the personality test is coming back and it doesn't meet the criteria, we won't pursue it. So how long is the interview process? Well, typically it's three to four interviews. Uh, they'll meet with my business partner first. Then if he gives me the green light, they'll meet with me. And then they'll meet with their mentor also. And then we may get back in touch with them again for the fourth interview. Uh, so it's a it's a process, and we're trying to talk them out of the job. Oh, really? We're sharing with them the negatives that they're going to experience, and the negatives their spouse is going to experience, <laughs> because we've had some issues in the past 
where they came from a nine to five job, their spouse ex was raised a nine to five job, and now they get into this where they're taking phone calls after five o'clock, they're taking phone calls at nine o'clock at night, they're being interrupted on the weekends. That can take a toll on the spouse if she's not prepared for that. You know, some of the best hires I've ever seen are children of real estate agents because they know what to expect. Yes. yes. Well, my wife, again, she's my rock and the supporter. Her father owned grocery stores. Mm -hmm. So they were working all the time. Yeah, he came home for dinner and then would go back and would go back at nine o'clock um, at night and he worked the weekends. So she, she grew up, she understood that. Right. Uh, but it was, that was a learning opportunity for me was not everyone's wired that way. Yeah. So we're trying to set those expectations. You know, that's what you do in a good listing pitch. You set expectations for the entire transaction. You know, when you're hiring somebody, set expectations yeah. right ahead. That makes yeah. sense to yeah. me. This is your team. You run it. What are your thoughts on leadership? <sighs> leadership. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big sigh, Greg. Right. Um, you have to... For my personal belief in leadership is to be able to help uh, your team members grow personally and professionally. And personally is probably more important than professionally because if they're growing personally and you're helping them with personally, the professional just falls right into place. Oh man, you're speaking my religion. I couldn't agree with you more. How do you help them grow personally? Well, when we're, when we're interviewing them, we share with we're very goal oriented, um, and we want to know about your personal goals and your business goals. We were, Rob and I were just talking about this morning some of ex employers, just how awful they were, um, and I said I'll never be that way. Um, and I tell everyone I want you to love what you're doing. If you aren't, I don't want you to stick around. It's too important. To me for you for and I and I walk the talk so several years ago I had one of my team members come up to me and say hey Craig you know you share with me us that we don't have the passion we should start looking she says I think I want to take another road and I respected that I want, wanted to make sure we couldn't do so, anything different but we couldn't but I left her there for six months to find something you know just as I do in the real estate business if you give your notice you're gone you're gone uh, but, Even if you think about giving your notice, you're gone. Yeah, and she left her there for six months, and the other team members are watching, saying, "Okay, is he really backing up what he said?" And I'm very sincere on that. Is I really want them to have a passion in what they're doing because life's too short. I, I've believed for many decades that what's ever in the best interest of my team members is in my best interest and helping them to become the person that they want to be in life is in my best interest. Yes. And um, I, I always get amazed when a team leader will get bent out of shape when somebody leaves them. Mm -hmm. And it was the right thing for them to do to, for them to leave, but they take it personally. Yeah. Hey, I, are you disappointed? Yes, you're disappointed. Sure. Uh, but again, hopefully you know that person well enough um, and hopefully you can provide the services to them and the environment and the culture to them that they don't want to move. But everyone is an individual. I also think the other thing that I suspect that you bring to the team and leadership is you have worked hard your entire life. I mean, you've worked hard, hard. And just by demonstrating that to your team, that's a form of leadership too. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Five dollars. <laughs> So let's talk about what does a typical day look like for you, Craig? Typical day, um, I'll get up between 5 to 5.30 in the morning. Um, I have my quiet time. I do my prayer and devotional. Um, I read my affirmations, uh, read my goals. Are there any affirmations or goals you'd like to share? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm healthy. Mm. Uh, e healthy. Um, I exercise a minimum of four times a week. I'm a giving person. I love to give my time, money, and knowledge. Um, uh, Any goals? I have a long-term goal. Um, I had a great mentor that really helped me understand about giving. And I always, was think, always thought about the 10% tithing 
but after talking to my mentors, I was like, just, again, just whatever you can give. So each year I try to give a little more and more each year. My goal is by when I'm 70 years old, I'm giving over a half of my income away. That is a goal of mine where I can be financially sufficient, where when the income I'm earning, I can give over half of that away. That's that, awesome. That will give me uh, great satisfaction. You're a good man, Craig. Don't tell that to too many people. <laughs> I think they know it, Craig. I think they know it. As usual, I interrupted. We were talking about your typical day. So you go through your affirmations and, and your goals. Goals. Um, and then, again, I want to exercise at least four times a week. So I'll probably go to the gym or I'll walk in my neighborhood for three miles. Um, or you'll go golfing. Uh, golfing is, uh, that's that starts on Thursdays. Okay. Uh, that starts on Thursdays. Um, but typically I will... Uh, prepare my day at my office, home office, and I'll get into the office between 9 and 9.30. Uh, Mondays, I still call past clients on their birthdays, on their anniversaries. I still, I have... How many calls do you make a week? Well, on Mondays, I try to put everything together. On Mondays, it's anywhere from 50 to 80 phone calls a week. A day, I, a day on Mondays. I gotta tell you, the third trait of all the everybody that I'm interviewing that's a top agent is they pick up the phone and they make the phone calls. I think you were talking to me earlier. I keep on I'm going away from the subject, uh, but the beginning when you started your career, you were making cold calls all day. Oh yes, yes. I was for sale by owners, expireds, and just calling around neighborhoods. And my son that's in the business with me, he's been with me 10 years, he's still doing circle prospecting to this day. Wow. It's a big difference. And I would have suspected that was a big way to, to fast start your career. Yes. Even though it did take you six months to start. <laughs> yes. All right. So you work out, you go to the office around 9, 930. Then what? Then we start making the phone calls. Um, and then I'll have a huddle with my team, and that's virtual on Mondays. Um, and then I'll go back on to the phone calls. And I call every client that's, so I shared with you, we settled between 425 to 450 this year. I'll call every client that settles with us and just thank them for using us, making sure they were happy, how everything was handled by our team, and just remind them if they know if someone is thinking about buying or selling, please contact their agent on our team on their cell phone um, if they know someone that has a real estate need. So I put all that on my Monday calls. And then Tuesday, I have my um, listing agent meeting. I have a leadership meeting um, in the morning. Um, and then I'll reserve appointments. Sometimes I will go out and appointments with some of my listing agents if they need me. I'd say I probably go on less than 10% of listing appointments. My listing agents can take care of it. But once in a while, someone will want to meet me personally because of the type of marketing we do. Um, and then Wednesday, I have a huddle in person. And then I have a buyer's agent meeting on Wednesday afternoons. You know, um, I don't know about you, but I still enjoy listing appointments. There's something fun about it. It gives you that adrenaline flow. Yeah. So that's why I still like to go. I, I like to, but I go out on the appointment. And then I, I delegate. Yeah, it. It off. delegate. <laughs> yes, yes. But I, I like yesterday. I went on one right before you came down, and I really enjoyed that time, uh, the hour, hour and a half. You, it's a way to connect to somebody else. It's a way to really try to find out what's in their best interest, and it's also a way to be competitive and win. Yes, <laughs> yes. That competitive side, <laughs> yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a buzz. But then Thursday, I start slowing down. And then I'll try to be on the golf course by 1 o'clock on Thursday. And then the weekend, we usually go down to our New Jersey house. Awesome. So let's get into the meat of things. What were some key moments in your career where your business really grew? Um, the one was Jim McPhail from my team was my top buyer's agent. Um, and when I started growing the team, he would start um, training the other buyer's agents coming on board. Um, but we went to a leadership conference. Um, oh, this is probably 10 years ago. And from that leadership conference, we decided to step out of the day-to-day -day business and become more leaders. Mm. So when Jim and I stepped out of that role and became more focused on working on the business versus in the business, um, then the team really, really took off. Um, and 
Uh, and I, did profitability take off too at that yeah, point? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Were there any other moments uh, that helped to, you saw your business start to grow substantially because of things that you did? Well, we went a different route in marketing also. Um, we started marketing with television and radio. Uh, we used Matt Wagner um, at Real Estate um, Experts. Um, yeah, I know Matt, he's a good guy. In fact, I went to one of his things. Yes, and uh, that really opened it up for us with our marketing. Uh, so that helped us take it to the next level also. And um, that was initially started out as radio ads and then it went on to um, television, yes. correct? Yes, yep. Uh, why don't we talk about that now, even though it's lead generation, why don't we talk about how can you afford a television ad or real uh, radio ad? Because I think to most of our listeners, it sounds like it would be way too expensive for them. And it really depends on your marketplace. Uh, like in New York, it would be it's too, expensive. too expensive. But there's what's called OTT. And OTT is you can be set doing those television commercials on uh, cord cutters. So those um, providers that provide television, but it's not part of the cable or not part of the main networks, you can go that way. I actually use cable with my advertising. Um, and it's, it's very affordable. And it's cable, but local. Yes. Local for even national events. Yes. Okay. yes. I, like I'll be on ESPN, I'll be on the Golf Channel, TNT, Fox News. So I'll be on those channels. Uh, with, a, with the television. So when you started out in radio first, what was your, your expenditure per month for radio ads? I would say it was probably around two to $3,000 a month. And that would be one 30, one thirty second uh, spot a day for three weeks a month. And what are you spending now on radio ads? My radio is only around three to four thousand now, and okay. then my television uh, is anywhere from eight to ten thousand, depending on the month I'm, I'm doing that. And again, is eight to ten thousand? We said that's on local cable, local cable, even though it may be covering national spots. Correct. And um, I believe you do ads with Barbara Corcoran. Correct. Yes. Uh, Matt made that introduction. Um, and uh, I'll go up to New York City probably once every 12 to 16 months for taping. And we'll tape uh, two to three new type of uh, commercials up there. Awesome. How long, how long does that take to do the taping? Because she runs through them, I Yeah, imagine. she does. She does. It takes me probably an hour to two hours. And the concept, we're going to show one of your ads on this, but... The concept is if Barbara endorses you, you must be good? Yes. Okay. Saying I'm the top realtor in this area and I'd highly recommend you to talk to him and his team. Okay, good. Yep. In this real estate market, you want someone you can trust in the driver's seat. In Lancaster, that's Craig Hartraft. He's helped thousands of families just like yours turn challenges into solutions. Craig and his team have over 500 five-star reviews because he sells more homes for more money. If he can't sell your home on terms you agree to, he will buy it. Get the option that's right for you. Go to LancasterHome.com and trust Craig to get you the most money guaranteed. Craig, do you have any general selling principles? I don't know the selling principle, but a key thing I always share with our agents is setting expectations. Mm. Um, if you set those expectations with the client ahead of time, it is going to make it so much smoother. On the listing side, we have what's called a bitch list. Mm -hmm. so we, we call it B list. But it's basically any complaint a seller has had in the past. And it's a legal size paper. Oh, really? And it's a checklist. We, it's like a pilot checklist. We, we go through it. We explain to them how the showings are going to be set up, some of the frustrations they're going to experience during showings, lights left on, doors unlocked. Would you be willing to share that B list with the members of our community? I'd be more than happy to. Be awesome. more than happy. That'd, and, be, that'd be great. And they can make their own because every, it's, it could be market to market, but anything that is typically comes around with some type of complaint. Talked about pricing, what to expect with pricing. So we're telling them about the price and what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to talk about if they get offended with offers, uh, how they're going to feel. We're going to share with them. We talk about the market. We talk about the market can be a hero or a villain. But keep in mind, we're not the 
villain or the hero, it's the market. So we're setting those expectations up with our clients. I, uh, you brought up one of the things that I think I have a really good script for is that, you know, I'll say during the listing presentation, you're going to get, we're going to get low offers. I don't want you to be offended by a low offer. Let me tell you why. Number one, if we're getting low offers, it means we're priced right. That a regular offer will come in, the one that you want, just wait. And two, I get to use that low offer in my negotiations by saying when somebody's interested, you know, there is an offer on the table, and if you're interested, you may want to move more quickly than slowly on this. And it's always an opportunity, I should Always. Always an opportunity. And our, we started changing about our, how we describe pricing to homeowners, and it took so much stress off us. Because uh, we feel like we have to be perfect when we give a price on a home, or we're concerned the other realtor is going to give a higher price mm. and we're going to lose out on it. We share with the consumers there's three values to your home. First is our appraised value, and their appraised value is done by a certified appraiser, and they have a certain formula they have to work with with comparables. So that's the appraisal. There's market value. The market value is based on supply and demand. Back in 2008 during the recession, a lot of times the market value was less than the appraised value because there was not a demand, there was so much supply. But now after COVID, we're finding that there's very little inventory and more of a demand, so market value can be higher. Typically a normal market, the market value and appraised value is close to the, the mark, but it can be different. And then the third value, Mr. Masso, is your value. What is your goal to walk away with? We're going to take those under consideration when we review pricing. So we're going to try to copy what an appraiser would be doing with the comparables. Not saying that's what it's going to sell for. Keep in mind, market value could be much higher. By saying that, that really helps us with the pricing because if the seller's disappointed with what we think their appraised value will be, we're sharing with them, keep in mind, it can be higher than that. And that has helped us secure more listings versus losing listings if someone came in with such a high price just to get the listing. That's interesting. And do you ever bring in an appraiser to actually appraise property? Yes, we'll share with them saying, if you feel we're completely off, here's our recommendation is get a third party, meaning an appraiser come in. They, and who pays for that? They pay for that upfront. We will reimburse them at settlement uh, for their appraisal. Good, good plan. So, Craig, break down the sources of your closed deals. Um, I just spoke to my assistant um, to give me a year to date here recently. 29% is our past clients, our um, cl past clients that refer us business is 29%. 26% is uh, Zillow. Uh, we're in the Zillow Flex program. Which surprises me that it's that high. Yeah, uh, me too. Uh, but it's been very helpful, especially for our newer agents. Our veteran agents don't want to use it because they're so busy with their sphere of influence and their Plus platform. the cost of a Zillow lead is a lot mm -hmm. higher than the cost of other leads. Yes, but it's, it's a great tool to be able to give my newer agents instant business to help them grow their business. Do you know what percentage of the Zillow leads are actually converted into closed deals? I don't. Okay. Um, if you were going to guess. We we're typically putting around 10 to 12 under contract a month. And how many Zillow leads are you getting a month, do you think? Between 100 uh, to 125. So about 10% or so. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good number. Okay. Um, it's old-fashioned sign calls back in the 80s and 90s. Right, right. Um, so it's a high-quality type of lead. And then our third highest one is our internet slash Google. Um, and I think that's around 21, 22% of our business. So that puts you up at about 80% of your leads are coming from those three major sources. Yep. We've talked about some of your lead sources being radio, TV, um, Zillow, uh, internet. Um, are we getting any leads from other sources? Farming. Okay. Back in 1997, I started farming a particular zip code. The zip code I live in, our office is in, my kids went to school there. We're up to 13 households, uh, 13,000 households we send a card like this. It's, a, it's an oversized card. You have to fold it and put it in a mailbox. 
Um, it's very obnoxious, but we're sending a message out there, and that has really gave us credibility because we're so consistent. And you're that doing that monthly? We're doing that monthly. What's your monthly budget? It's around $5,500 a month. That includes print and mailing costs. And you're hitting how many homes? 13,000. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of homes. How do you distribute those leads once they come in? So, f again, I have listing agents. The only thing they do is work with the homeowners. So someone's on duty w once a day. So whoever's on duty that day will get that seller lead. Now, on the buying side, it's basically all my agents get notified at the same time when a lead's coming in through our Internet. And it's first person that responds. Um, we'll get it. Hmm, what sort of atmosphere does that create? I could see it being really good. I could also see it being really bad. Well, it came out of necessity because uh, mm. we used to have agents on duty on the buyer side too. But we, we found when, if they were busy, they were not... Speed to lead is so crucial. I mean, speed to lead is so crucial. So we were finding those leads were not being returned on a timely manner. So we finally said we had to just open it up to everyone saying, hey, whoever's available How first. How do you distribute to everyone? Is, there a, is it a, a pager thing? Is it an email, text? Um, it will be a text um, and an email, depending on what other sources. We, and, um, and who sends that out? It's all automated. Oh, really? Yeah. What's the automation system? We have what's called call rail. So if a lead's being called in off a source, it will ring all their phones at the same time. Mm. Uh, so all everyone's phones, same thing with Zillow. Uh, whoever's participating in the Zillow leads, all their phones are going off at the same time. And is that by call rail too, or is that by the Zillow platform? By the Zillow platform. Got it. Yeah. So we talked earlier about um, you reaching out to your database every Monday and making a mess of calls. Um, what CRM do you use? We use what's called Close, uh, uh, C-L-O-Z-E. Um, it has a great... Um, platform for either your phone and your PC. And are there any other ways that you remain in touch with your... Yeah, we'll do events for our clients and we'll, we'll do a giveaway once a month. Uh, so they just have to put their name in for a drawing and then we're, we're confirming their email address and updating right. our database there. Um, but we, we'll give like $250 value. Uh, could be to a grocery store, could be to a look, like we have Hershey Park close by. Um, it could be Longwood Gardens down in Philadelphia, something different every time of some value. Back to school shopping. How many people sign up for that? I want to say if we have a really good drawing, sometimes we'll have five to six hundred people sign up for it. Interesting. And then um, how, how do you reach out to them to tell them about the uh, promotion? Um, email now. Okay. Uh, it used to be mailers, now it's just email. Um, so the email will go out saying we have this drawing, um, they just fill out a landing page. And, they and then do you follow up with letting everybody know who won? Yes. Okay. We'll promote that in our newsletter um, that goes out on a and month And maybe ago. have a picture of them while they're at the yeah. event. Yeah, and their agent that was assigned to them was the one that's reaching out to them and saying, hey, congratulations, you got this gift card after this drawing. Awesome. Uh, any other uh, events? We'll do some annual events, like we'll, in the summertime, we'll do movie night. Um, we'll rent out a couple movie theaters, and that gets sold out instantly. Uh, something's been big hit was uh, meeting with Santa Claus mm. uh, in December. Uh, so we'll do a couple events throughout the year to uh, invite our clients to. What would you say is the most successful piece of marketing you've ever done? That could be anything, a commercial, a mailing, an email. I would say it's our farming because how consistent we've been. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've been doing it since 1997. So I'm very established in the community. My face is in someone's mailbox every month. I'm almost like a mini celebrity in the area. I go out, people will approach me, say, hey, I've seen you on TV or I've, I've received your mailers. Um, so that is just having that presence. Do you like that? No. I'm a, <laughs> I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert. Um, so people, Interesting. You don't come across as one. Well, I'm a good chameleon. Okay. I'm a good chameleon, but yeah, I'm very uncomfortable. In Pennsylvania, we're required, we can't have a fictitious name for a team. Right. So I can't say the Lancaster group. I have to use my name. I have to use my face in the promotion. If I could do it otherwise, I would in a heartbeat. But because of the state I'm in and the Real Estate Commission rules, 
I can't get away with it. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you use social media, and is it effective? We do. We're just starting a video campaign. Uh, we just launched that probably nine months ago, and we're still learning the process where we'll put out two videos a week uh, with some type of information to provide to buyers or sellers, uh, educational pieces, or I'll interview my uh, agents with some educational pieces to give out. So we're just starting that. And what platforms are you using? Uh, we're using that in Instagram, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn at this point. Got and it. YouTube, we're just starting with YouTube now. I'll be interested to see which platforms are working out best for you. Craig, what do you do that's either different or you do it more effectively or you do it, you're just more spectacular at it than almost any other agent in your market? Well, the marketing is where I really stand out than any other competitor in Lancaster County. And it's because of how long I've been around too. Um, but the communication, setting expectations, we have really improved in the last five to seven years that has really helped us provide great customer service because we're setting those expectations. But I go to some of these conferences and when I speak at the conferences, they, they want a magic pill. Mm. saying, I, I need this magic pill to be successful, and I'm always disappointing, with, disappointing them when I give them the answer. And the key is customer satisfaction is where you're going to get those referrals. And to do that, it's the communication. If someone calls you, call them back as soon as possible. And if you're trying to get an answer for them, and you don't have the answer by the end of the day, still call them back and let them know what you did to get the answer, and you don't have it yet, but get back to them the next day. Don't let a client call you before you call them. Good piece of advice. Yeah, That's a pearl. Yeah, it is a pearl. If you were a newer agent in this business or you're an agent moving to another marketplace, what would you recommend where they should spend their money? If I was a new agent or a veteran agent going to a different market, I would join a team first. Yeah. I, would for, I would join a team first just to get that foundation into the, that marketplace learning more about that park marketplace and getting instant um, leads immediately. Um, that would be my first step, what I would be doing. If I would be starting without joining a team, I'd be going for the low cost activities and that would be the open houses. And I would do what I, what I did, calling for sale by owners, calling expires. My son's in the business with me for 10 years and he is still doing that. He's doing the call rounds in the neighborhoods. If there's an expired around, he's after the expireds. Uh, so I, I repeat what I did in the past. I would say that so many agents have a fear of picking up the phone and making a cold call. Do you have any advice for how to, they can get over themselves? I had that fear too. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a big introvert, uh, so it, but I'm motivated uh, and I'm goal oriented and I was willing to put up with the, those fears. And those fears are misleading. Very few people are gonna get upset with you over the phone. And again, I go into it not as a salesperson, I'm just calling in saying, I just wanna let you know a home down the street just sold recently. We had three offers and we just wanted to give you an update on the marketplace. Uh, do you have any general questions on the value of your home or do you have any type of real estate needs in the next couple of years? No, okay. Do you know of anyone that maybe want to be moving in the area or moving out of the area? Can we help? No. Do you mind if I stay in touch with you and send you a business card? Non-threatening. And then I just put the business card in or a pre-listing package in the mail to them and then every six months I'm staying in touch with them. How long did it take you? Because this is really great. No pressure. You're not selling. You are selling, but you're not selling. Um, you're really just letting them know that you're there. Yeah. Um, how long did it take before you started to see results? <sighs> it, it took a while. I would say when I first started doing it, it was probably a good three months until you started getting some traction. And then after a year or two, that, that, that pipeline gets filled. How did you keep your spirits up even though those first three months? It just, I, I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to, I just had to keep on filling that pipeline. But I don't want to refer to my son all this, all these times, but one thing I'm really proud of him, and this is when he was newer in the business, his mentality was so right. He's saying, if I can just have an introduction to someone, don't even meet with them, but they're saying yes to my business card, 
I put that in my funnel, guess what? It's going to come back. And then several years later, he, he, he says, this is working, Dad. Uh, these leads are calling me back. And he didn't have to compete with the leads because he was the only one staying in touch with them. It was only a phone call every six months. That really doesn't cost you anything except time. Yeah. The, um, and I would imagine his last name didn't hurt him. <laughs> so you were talking about that you were motivated. What motivates you? What drives you? Fear. Fear. It's, it's, it's interesting how fear is a great motivator. Tell me how it actually works with you. Well, in the beginning was fear, meaning I did not want to fail. Uh, had no option to fail. Uh, I was starting a young family, quit a salary job. So that just, the, 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 well, I wasn't going to fail. I had to provide. Um, now I do have long-term goals um, and personal growth, business growth. Uh, so the, that, that goal is my main driving fo focus. Awesome. Let's talk about a touchy subject. Uh, profitability. Um, what do you want to share about that? Because you know, not everybody's comfortable talking about it. Yeah, I'm very proud of it. Um, in the very beginning, I wasn't. Um, Howard Burton, our mentor, um, I won't forget when I went to his first conference back in the mid 90s. Um, people were talking about billboards and advertising in the newspaper, personal promotion, bus benches, you know, everything. And guess what? I went Hobbs Herder, Hobbs Herder. And I did it all. And I will forget, I jumped from like 50 transactions to 120 tra transactions in less than a year and a half doing all this. But then I learned about a thing called a profit and loss statement. <laughs> and when I looked at the profit and loss statement, I wasn't making no money. Um, and thank goodness I learned that in the very beginning or I really could have got myself in trouble. And I, I could have got myself in trouble if I didn't have the right things lined up the proper way. I mean, I was borderline. Uh, but got my act together and been really watching my budget. So, <clears throat> so you're a, you're a high lead generating team, and you're paying more for leads than many teams are paying because you have a different team type in terms of lead generation. So your profitability is going to be less overall because you're paying more for leads. But that leads is allowing you to have more on your team, which increases your overall profitability. Correct. It may not be as high per agent, but overall it'll be higher. Yeah. So. I'll say gross income. So that's before my broker gets paid out. It's before I pay out my agent. So it's the number before I pay anything out. Uh, right now I'm running 25%. And do you uh, know what it is after the, the brokerage, after the agents are paid and the brokerage firm is paid? Yeah, typically around 50%. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good. So it's around Comparing 50. it to others. Yeah. And it's hard because your lead costs are a little <laughs> higher but it allows you to support everybody because a lot of teams have a hard time generating leads. That's clearly not your problem. That, that was our philosophy. My business partner and I, Jim, always went, we'd rather have too many leads uh, for our agents so we don't have that issue. And our, our team members are intimidated if we bring another team member on. They're not concerned right. like, hey, what's going to happen with the lead flow? We don't have that issue. That's good because I've seen that happen on a lot of teams. And when people come to me about starting a team, I, I always try to find out what is the main reason why you want to start a team. Um, and if they're not going to provide leads to... What's the purpose? Yes. Someone shared this with me before and hit it right on the head. There's two type of animals. There's a jungle animal and there's a farm animal. The jungle animal goes out and kills his own prey. A farm animal gets fed. And on my team, in my structure, jungle animals won't stay on my team. If they can go out and hunt their prey and get it themselves, there's no need for right. me. A farm animal is a great animal, and, but needs to be fed. They are the ones that do a great job on my team, and they're rock stars. So when I'm looking at, the, I've turned down top producers uh, before that wanted to come. They were going to put too much stress on my structure of my team behind right. the scenes. So I'm always looking at that point where 
I'm not going for the jungle animal because people get fussed. Well, my team's not prospecting. My team's not pro. If you're going to find someone that can prospect and be successful, they're not going to stick around much or their split's going to be so much higher. It's not going to be profitable for you. So that's the success of our team. That makes sense. I like that. What metrics do you use to analyze your business? Well, for income, it's the prof, uh, QuickBooks, profit and loss. Uh, but for our transactions and uh, sources of business, uh, conversion rates is called SISU, S-I-S-U. Um, so the agents will fill out when they have the lead, the source of the lead, when the lead goes under contract, when the lead settles. So we have those metrics to be following. Do you have any trouble getting them to fill that out? <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm not going to fool you or your audience. It's a challenge. Uh, my assistant really tries to help out, but she really gets on them by the end of the month because she's the one that's taking that data and then organizing that data. So uh, we try to stay on them, but it's, it's difficult. We talked earlier about personal growth is probably more important than uh, real estate growth in general. So what are some factors that you've seen that affects your ability to be the best version of Craig at work that is actually outside of the workplace? Starting out the f beginning of the day, the morning routine. Mm. Um, I just had this conversation with some of my leadership on my leadership team recently preparing for our annual goal planning. And I can honestly say being intentional going into the day versus being reactionary. And if I can start with my perfect day and get my mindset right, it's going to help me throughout the day. But if I don't start that morning routine and I'm just rushing around and then I'm just reactionary all day. You're reactive as opposed to setting your, it's, your schedule. It's, and I'm, we're, we're really going to share this at our t team building is you have to be intentional. So many people are not intentional about their day. And w when I go in the office, I know what I'm going to be doing in my office. And I think sometimes when we have struggling team members, they have no idea what they're doing for the day. And then they have all that wasted time trying to figure it out. But I know my day is going to be structured why I'm going in for that day. Yeah, I, I would say a great book on this is The One Thing by Gary Keller. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great, great, yes. great book on it. And it's a great concept. Um, I also feel that that morning ritual grounds you so you can be intentional. So if you're the agent that picks, wakes up in the morning and starts looking at their emails right away, you're not grounded and you're going to be much more reactionary than intentional. Ground yourself, then, then you can uh, focus. And I've also found I have certain energy shifts during the time of day. So when I get a really, really difficult email that requires a lot out of me, I'll let them know I will get back to them the next day because I'm at my best in the morning. I'm not my best at 4 p.m and I'm even worse at 7 p.m. So um, I can't respond to those things because I won't be the best version of myself. I, I'm the same way. It, my morning time is where I get the most energy. By three or four o'clock, I'm, I'm shot. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever had a real estate coach? Yes. How did that go? Went very, very well. Uh, Howard was my coach. Oh, he was your personal coach? Yeah. Howard Britton, who was part of Star Power, who's yeah. no longer alive. Yeah. Yeah, he was a good man. Yep, and then... Uh, I had a gentleman named Bob Proctor, too. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Bob Proctor was a coach for a number of years, too. And what else do you do to grow your real estate skills and knowledge? I'm a podcast junkie. What's your favorite real podcast? It doesn't have to be real estate. What's your favorite? Um, Darren Hardy um, is it's just a t 10, it's like a three to five minute every day. I, I really enjoy that. Um, Tom Ferry, I think Tom Ferry has done a fabulous job. So mm. I'll listen to his podcast, uh, his recordings. But I'm all about efficiency, and I tr really try to share this with my team members. If it's a YouTube video, I still treat it like a podcast. Yeah. Is I have a Bluetooth speaker in my bathroom, and when I get into that bathroom in the morning, I turn on my phone, and if I'm listening to something when I'm preparing for the day. 
So while I'm taking a shower, I'm preparing, I'm brushing my teeth, I have at least 30 minutes of something, or an audio book. Uh, I have something in my head, and, and I feel like I robbed time. I got 30 minutes of something while I'm just preparing for the day. And it's setting your intention for the day. Yeah, and then when I'm driving in, I'm listening, and my drive in is like 10 minute drive in, I'm listening to it. Oh my God, the traffic here in Lancaster is crazy. <laughs> I know he, he, he like lives a second away here and it takes 10 minutes to get here. Oh, it was rush hour. Oh, okay. It was rush hour. Okay. I'll defend Lancaster County with the traffic. It's okay, just not <laughs> rush hour. Tell me one of the biggest mistakes you made that was probably your greatest learning lesson. I'll answer that, but I have another, another pro I want to share. Okay. Um, Howard Britton helped me with this too, is if there's ever a mistake made, don't ever attack the person, attack the system. And we don't call them mistakes on our team, we call them learning opportunities. Mm. Um, and we really walk the talk. And what I mean by learning opportunities, we get together once a week, listing agents as a group, and buyers agents as a group, and we'll come there and the agents will be vulnerable. They will share their learning opportunities. Because you've created a safe environment and they're not worried about being attacked. Yes. And it's amazing by having that weekly meeting. I learn every day from those meetings because mm -hmm. I'm not in the field like they are. Or I'm reminded about something I forgot about a while ago. Um, but because the agents are willing to share their learning opportunities. Um, and that has just created a great culture, atmosphere with the team that they're willing to share. Um, and I guess the biggest mistake I made, I may have not done that in the very beginning, and I could have had turnover, but it went after I switched that th uh, thought process of it's a learning opportunity, it has helped us dramatically. Um, you know, on our team, I always tell our team that the first time you make a mistake, no problem whatsoever. This is, you're going to learn from this and you won't do it again. And thank God you made the mistake. So we're further along on the road. If you make the same mistake a second time, then let's sit down and have a talk and let's figure out what's, what's going on up here. If you make a third time, we might have a little bit of a problem yeah. then. But yeah, we always go for the system. And a lot of times it will be the system. Yeah. Um, but that's, we've, we focus on the system. But another mistake I've made in the past um, is that I felt my drive, my goals or my expectation for a team member because I knew their potential, I felt they should be able to do X amount in volume or transactions. And what I found out is I can't judge my team member if they don't have that same drive. drive. And it took me a while to learn that. Um, but I respect that now. So I understand if I have a team goal in mind, I know, okay, if that's their goal, I may need to bring another team member or two on. on. Yeah. But that was a big learning opportunity for me because I knew their potential. But if they don't want that for themselves, then it's wrong on my part trying to put that on them. Yeah, one of the teams I coach has that, has that same problem on their team, and I said it shouldn't be a problem to the team leader. This is what this person is willing to do in terms of hours. They do a good job, respect them, and bring somebody else yep. on. Yep. And, don't, and don't, there's no need to get angry at them because it goes back to what's ever in my team's best interest is also in my best yes. interest. Yep. What is the most expensive sale your team has ever done? Just recently, we just put one under contract for $3.2 million. Awesome. What's the least expensive one you've done the last five years, your team? Probably a uh, $75,000 uh, mobile home. Double wide or single? Uh, single. Okay. What do you get for $3.2 million? That was a farm at. Um, had a, a 
Is that like a kitchen net, a farm net? <laughs> it's a smaller farm. Okay. Uh, barn with four or five uh, horse stalls, um, and I think it was like 30 acres, 50 acres of land. And a really nice house. And yeah, buildings. absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Do you love this business, and if so, why? I love this business. People always ask, when are you retiring? I'm not retiring. What a ridiculous question. Yeah, I agree. I'm not retiring. Um, I may slow up, but I'm not retiring. Um, I, what would you do with your life if you retired? It's yeah. Get me started. Yeah. On this and one. you only can play so much golf. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but what I love about this business now is a little bit different than when I was in it in the beginning. Yeah. I when you talk about coaching, I'm a mentor slash coach to my to my team members to help them personally, and that is. Awesome. It's just, I love when I have a new team member come in and they're looking at the veteran agents and they're seeing the income potential and you can see in their eyes they have doubt that can they do it. And then when we come alongside of them and they can do it and they see it and it changes their life, what they can do to provide for their family, for their community, that's a high to me. Mm. It is, it's just so neat to watch these team members just blossom and you could see the doubt in the beginning and a couple of years later they're there. That's, that's what I, I enjoy the most. Awesome. Um, yes. What's the proudest moment in your life? The proudest moment right now is I'm in a different stage of my life being a grandparent. Oh, you got the granddaddy vibes. Oh. I do. I have two sons. And you and Mate both, right? Oh, yeah. We have two sons, and uh, now I have three granddaughters and a grandson. But my two oldest are granddaughters, five and three. My name is Pops. Oh, I like that. But if I'm not listening to them, Popsy! <laughs> uh, they got me wrapped around the finger. Uh, but, they trained you well. Uh, but it is just so rewarding. I shared this with you earlier today in, the, in breakfast that when you first starting a career, you're newly married and you start having children, it's just, you're going to those 100 miles per hour and you really can't f have that one-on-one -on -one time. And fo I, I couldn't have back in those days. Now as a grandparent, a little bit more secure in the marriage, secure in the, financially, when you have those grandchildren for an hour, five hours, eight hours, what it is, you're focused on them and it's just, one-on-one -on -one. that is just so rewarding and I look forward being their mentor in the future and sharing with them lessons I have learned and helping them down the road that's what I'm really looking forward and but it's, that's and it's really rewarding for them too. it is it's a it's a good and it's nice that I can give the kids back to the parents too. oh for sure <laughs> for sure <laughs> what brings you joy um helping others Mm, yeah, that's been a theme today, hasn't it? It been? is. A giving back. Uh, God's, you're, a, you're a generous guy. God's blessed me in so many ways and being able to give back. And it's just not financially. It's oh, yeah. time, knowledge. Um, and again, sometimes that's the hardest part, giving time back. Um, but I often think giving time is more important than giving money. Oh, it, it's harder. Yeah. It's, it is really harder. Um, um, but yes. Um, and that's what drives me, too. Do you see any industry trends either now or coming on that we should be aware of? No, I think the internet has changed us dramatically uh, on lead sources, uh, how the consumers are finding their information. Um, and you can look at like Zillow. A lot of realtors hate Zillow. Um, uh, but you have to say, they're going to be around. How can that benefit you? And I shared with you earlier how that has benefited me. I st still think there has to be a personal touch in a real estate transaction. I know some people are just concerned online's going to take it over and no one's going to need a realtor. I don't believe that. There's I, don't, I don't believe that either. There's, there's going to be that personal touch in the transaction. So let's talk specifically about the new uh, uh, commission transparency since all of the lawsuits against NAR. Um, I feel like there's opportunity there. Oh, yes. Why don't we talk about, in your mind, where you think the opportunity lies for, to increase your market share? Well, I shared with my buyer's agents in the past, um, the listing agent really dictated how much you were going to be compensated with a real estate transaction. Yes. 
And when this came down the road, and we were doing this before the, this transition, right. some of our agents, uh, they believed in their value and they would enter in relationship with buyers saying, for you to get these services I'm offering and the value here, my fee's this. If the seller's not willing to participate, you're gonna make up the difference. So we had some agents doing that for a couple of years already. Oh, fascinating. Um, and I shared that with the rest of our team saying, this is gonna be an opportunity. And we're doing this interview end of September now, so it's been a good 30 days that we've been, this has changed. And they're thriving. Awesome. It was a mindset. And everything's it, a mindset. It was a, it was a mindset. And I, I think it's beneficial to our industry. It's going to make it more professional. I agree. And it's, it is going to be more transparent. And it does give a little bit more power to the buyer now than they had in terms of how they want their dollar spent, even though before it was coming from the seller. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's uh, I think it can be a good thing. I think it will weed out some uh, oh. less professional agents, I, I hope. I agree with you 100%. So Craig, where do you see yourself in five or 10 or 15 years from today? Gonna to be 60 uh, in April. Um, it's funny. So five years you see yourself uh, getting Medicare. <laughs> It's interesting, my team has asked me that question. And after, it's just not one team member, another team member, another team member said, hey, what's going to go on here in the next couple of years? I went, whoa, I need to start thinking about this. So I have assured the team members that I don't see much changing here for the next 10 years. When I turn 70, I may slow up a little bit more, uh, but I will never get, get out of the business or get out of the team. I'll still be there as a support or help them out. But I don't see much changing for myself within the next 10 years. Craig, you're clearly a great broker. Your team is highly professional and takes great care of their clients. If somebody out there wants to refer a client to you, how would they go about doing that? They would get, call us at 717-560-5051 uh, or our website, and that is Lancaster Home. Dot com. Singular? Yep. And we would love to help their clients out. I'm sure. I, lo I personally love referrals. I think they're some of the best clients. They're more likely to close than any other lead. Um, so, uh, yeah. But I want to say thank you to you and Rob for uh, coming down and visiting us. Oh, we've had fun. We've had fun. He's annoyed with me, but we've had fun. <laughs> well, we found out where the car chargers are. <laughs> <laughs> we also found the slowest car charger in all of the world uh, over at the Eaton Hotel across the street from your office. Craig, this was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like and subscribe. If you're interested in my real estate services in New York City or the Hudson Valley, coaching with me or speaking at an event, please visit patricklilly.com. Join us next month when we visit the Wendy Banner team in Bethesda, Maryland. Until then.